Welcome to Overthinking in Your Underwear. I'm Lindsay, and this week we're overthinking sex. Uh, best friend Trisha joins us along with relationship expert Jill to chime in with some profesh opinions. Um, so it's going to be a fun one. So actually, I kind of worded that wrong. So the truth is, I recorded the session yesterday with Jill and Trisha, and now I'm kind of doing the intro. And because I did that, um, I have some thoughts, some extra thoughts, some forethoughts, if you will, to share with you now based on on kind of our chat. So I want to get into that now about some things I, sometimes what you do here is you like record the pod and then you go back and you edit it and you go, oh, I wish I had said this, or I wish I'd had some extra thoughts on that because you kind of learn some things. I have some overthinking on our overthinking people. That's what's going on here. So one of the first things that kind of occurred to me after listening to this back was Jill had some really interesting thoughts about sex drive in your 40s and 50s. So Jill's a relationship therapist. And so obviously she sees couples come in and they're talking about their issues. And obviously sex is an issue that comes up a lot. So she says she actually sees a pretty big drop off in sexual desire in your 40s and 50s, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for it. And she gets into it. Women can even get to the point where they're just kind of like, you know what, I just don't even care anymore. You know, I don't even care about sex. And I think we could have a whole other overthinking session about how we can change that. You know, I don't think we have to hit midlife and just not care about this whole other part of our life and a whole other part of our self-expression. But she talks about that. And I think it's important. So as women in our 40s right here, we can feel normal if that is something we're going through. We can feel like we're not the only one. So Jill says, you know, she sees so many women that really just kind of don't even care about sex anymore. They don't care about sex in general. They don't care about sex with their partner. It's just not their focus. And I think that is, um, I think that that's completely understandable. I think that's completely understandable. You're building a life. You have so many other distractions. You have so many other things you're focused on. This part of yourself, this part of your self-expression is not what you're focused on. So she sees that as a problem with couples. She also said that some couples, it isn't even a problem because the partner's kind of in line too. So you can get into your later years, your 50s, your 60s, and they kind of look at each other and say, you know what, at the end of the day, how we connect is having this ritual of wine on the patio and then we go inside and cuddle and that's how we connect. That is intimacy. That is intimacy to us. And so what's really important is being on the same page about sex. And I think that is obviously a really huge takeaway. But to me, the takeaway that we I didn't mention in the podcast is marry your best friend <laughs> because Marrying hot sex isn't going to really get you anywhere, right? Hot sex, maybe the first couple of years, maybe not if you're lucky, maybe the first couple of years. But what about when you're in your 50s and your 60s? And really what that turns into is having a glass of wine on the porch and having a nice little, you know, ritual of walking around the pond in your backyard. And that becomes what intimacy is to you. And maybe not, maybe you're one of those couples that keeps it going forever. I don't want to depress you. If you're like a very sexual being, I am just saying that to me, what I took away from this was marrying hot sex <laughs> is probably not the best decision. Marry your best friend. Marry the person you can sit on the porch and talk to for the rest of your life. We get into the myths about sex. We get into sex when you're single. And we get into sex when you're married. Um, admittedly, I just want to say this is like a very hetero podcast um, because that's who, that's just my experience. And that's what I know. And I would love to have some of my other friends on here at different points and like give you guys a broader look at that too. Um, obviously, there's a million ways to have your sexual expression. Actually, in a few weeks, I want to talk to my niece and her friends and they were going to explain to me um, the sexuality spectrum. 
Not that I don't understand it. I do. But if there's anybody who has their hands on, has a handle on the spectrum of sexuality, it is a Gen Z person and they are ready to tell you about it. So I think that's going to be kind of a fun conversation too. Um, Okay. So what else I wanted to talk about kind of like in the forethought here of things that uh, came up in the edit is... We get into kind of like what is chemistry and we kind of like glaze over it. And I think it's such an interesting conversation. Like I've always like kind of when I, I'm dating or talking to someone and I'm, and I think you probably have too, when you're sitting there and you're like, oh my God, we just have so much chemistry. There's just so much chemistry. And it's like this really fluffy ethereal word that we say and like do any of us really know what it means you know what does it mean when we say that you have so much chemistry with someone obviously it's attraction obviously it means you're attracted to them obviously it means maybe you want to go to bed with them but where does it come from and is it based on pheromones is it based on hormones um like what, what is that biological component to it? So I wanted to dig into that a little bit more. So I found this article on betterhelp.com. I'll link it in the blog that gets into attraction and pheromones and chemistry. And it's really interesting. And also not because not to solve everything in a cerebral way, not to overthink everything, but sometimes after you go through kind of one of those big kind of like, oh my gosh, I was so attracted to him or her and maybe it didn't work out. Sometimes it's nice to kind of break it down scientifically and say, well, you know what? It was just science. It was just biology. And once that wears off, I'm going to be okay, you know? Um, so here it is, spare on attraction. Uh, scientists of osmology, I'm saying that wrong, definitely saying that word wrong, uh, have determined that individuals in the same species are attracted to each other through chemical messengers. These chemicals, pheromones, uh, can stimulate sexual arousal, desire, hormone levels, and even fertility when released. Pheromones are typically detected through smell and produced through sweat, saliva, and urine. People who, have, who feel a strong amount of attraction to another person or that feeling of love at first sight may actually be experienced for a pheromonal attraction. It's also possible that, possible that when you meet someone and automatically feel unattracted to them, you could be having the same reaction and opposite, meaning your pheromones repel each other. The pheromones could be telling you that this person is genetically appealing or a match for reproduction or genetically unappealing or not a match for reproduction. I think that's so interesting. Pheromones may not only be produced for sexual attraction. So the takeaway on this article says pheromones can be increased by exercising regularly. So that has to do with getting the toxins out of your body and letting your natural uh, pheromones rise to the top um, and like clearing your pores, kind of all that good stuff we already know but about exercise. So, I mean, this is just really interesting. I'm going to link this blog and I just scratched the surface. But again, like I said, um, these are just some of my four thoughts on uh, this great deep dive we do in this podcast. Uh, really love this conversation. Let's get into it more. Ready? Let's overthink it saw this question on a podcast last week, The Toast, uh, with Claudia and Jackie. Claudia is girl with no job. If you guys don't follow her, you should follow I her. She's she so is. funny. The Toast does not need me to promote their podcast, but I just want to say where I got this idea. So they posed this question and was like, are you a kiss on the mouth family or are you not a kiss on the mouth family? And I was like, okay, I have to answer this question and ask it with Trisha and Jill because <laughs> Trisha, are you a kiss on the mouth family? Yes. 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 I mean, like Trisha, you lay it on people when you she she's them. a kiss on friends too. She's yeah. a kiss on the guy at the gas station. <laughs> Very true. I mean, I where did you, you're a lover. Kiss. She's a lover. Where did this start with you and the kiss on the mouth? Mm -hmm. Does your whole family do this? No, actually, like my family in Iowa, like all of my mom's side of the family, like we scared them. I scared them. Um, but no, it was from growing up across the street from my parents' best Italian. friends and then being Italian. So that I mean, is, I'm Italian too. 
Yeah. So being raised around that, like having every Sunday dinner with them, them kissing us. Then I started dating Italians and then I'm kissing their whole family. Everyone was kissing everybody. Everybody And so then I go to Iowa and I am kissing them and they are like, what is going on here? Because they don't even barely hug. So hang on just a second. Um, Do you kiss your brother on the mouth? Well, it's not like directly on the mouth. But yes, yeah, it is I mean, because you kiss me yeah. on the mouth like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's more of like a yeah, off a side, side lip. I yeah. feel like it's only to the side because Brian and Brad, your brothers, turn to the side. I feel like you're going directly in and then Brian and Brad are like that. Brad's <laughs> yeah. definitely not wanting to kiss people on the mouth. Yeah. But he deep down, he's a lover. Yes. He is a lover. I kiss my dog on the mouth. So, I mean, no shade to whatever you do to humans. Yeah. Um, Okay. So we're also going to, we have like a whole thing we're going to talk about when it comes to sex. And we're going to talk about sex when you're single and sex when you're in a relationship and married, more partnered up sex. But we're going to start with kind of a little bit more fun things. So first of all, um, I found these and I'll link these in the blog just to give everybody credit and so you can read them. But um, the source.org has an article or a blog called 10 Myths About Sex We Believed at Some Point. So I'm going to go through them and you guys say true or false. Okay. 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 So the first, the first myth about sex is sex burns a lot of calories and can help with weight loss. True or false? Yeah, false. False. That's what I was going to say. That's yes. I was like, huh? okay. well, well, it's sort of true, but the thing is, is you'd have to have sex for like 30 or 45 minutes. That's what minutes. I was going to say. There's some like specific details that you would need to know. Like, is this an aerobic activity to the extreme exactly. where you're sweating? Like, or is this just we're going to the motions? To say we did it or what exactly is it? Yeah. i think they publish all those articles of like sex burns calories then it's like yeah but 30 or 45 minutes of very athletic sex yes. burns calories oh, yes. and we all know that's not the reality right no. Correct. Yes. okay two you can get pregnant when you're on your period i would say false it's i think it's true because i think Sperm can live inside of you for up to seven days, I think is what it is. And so you can have sex towards the end of your period and then the sperm can still be alive. And if you release your egg within that time frame, then it can actually happen, I think. Yes, you can get pregnant um, on your period. For most women, a single menstrual cycle lasts 28 days and five of those days are taken up with their period. Um, I'm not going to read this short thing. I'm not going to okay, read this whole thing. Jill explained it better. The truth is you can get pregnant on your period. So um, this is another one from Men's Health. Um, kind of the same idea. So men reach their sexual peak at 18 and women reach theirs at 28. I feel like that's something that's always out there. Is that true or false? Mm, men are at 28 and women are no, when? No. Men are at 18, women are at 28. Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Because I had also remember hearing growing up that it was like in their, in their 40s, like women's is at 45. I always but, heard that too. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm. Ooh. I would say false. Yeah. This is yeah. true. I was going to say, I think it is. And I think women are older when they hit their peak, but I don't know which one it is because obviously it's changed. Yeah, it says uh, testosterone peaks at 18 for men and women's estrogen. So maybe it's just like how they're wording it. Women's estrogen, um, yeah, hits its high point in their mid-20s. So maybe it's just like what those articles are we always re- we read as like sexual desire for women is higher in their 40s or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I can tell you that is not the reflection I hear in my practice. <laughs> Yeah, what do you the, hear? The, sexual, the, the drive. The Yeah, the sex drive or desire for women does not seem high. And in some cases, it's non-existent for women in their 40s. Yes. Based on what I see in my practice, yes. Do you think that's um, hormones or satisfaction? Or where do you think that comes to play? Yeah, I think it's hormones. I think you can definitely obviously be like premenopausal um, at that time. Um, 
And I think if that peak thing is there, then they're kind of over it and they don't care at all. I mean, I sadly, I've heard many times, um, not just from my clients, but also from friends that like they don't care if they ever have sex again mm -hmm. in their 40s. Yeah. yeah like they're just over it. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it can also be you're distracted, you're stressed. I mean, you know, sex is super emotional and for women especially. Um, and so it's harder for them to compartmentalize as, as life is more stressful. So that could be the case in your 40s. Um, then obviously it is in your 20s. In your 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we'll we'll get into some more of that, that good stuff too. Mm -hmm. um, oysters make you horny. I've always heard that. It's an aphrodisiac, right? Ooh, There's really? no scientific evidence that. that oysters make you horny. I knew chocolate was, right? People always say that, but I've eaten oysters and never. <laughs> I've never gotten <laughs> horny. Well, it's really, well, we have oysters every Thanksgiving and I've never noticed like my family is just like completely riled up afterwards. Thank <laughs> God. Riled. Thank God. Well, and it says it's false. So that's good well, to I know. I've never heard that. Yeah. Yes. Um, men think about sex every seven seconds. I don't know. I feel like saying true. Yeah. I was going to say, if I had to say roll the dice, the true. It says false. The number is tossed around. That number is tossed around a lot. But the truth is that only 23% of men claim to fantasize frequently. So that's what that says. Got it. Yes. Um, Having sex before a big event or a big game um, can ruin your performance. I've heard that a lot. Yes. Yes. It says I, false. I, huh. Uh, Swiss researchers, researchers performed, I mean, footballers, footballers, because I'm suddenly I'm in London. No, um, I feel like football players are always saying like they don't have sex before games because of that. Yeah. Well, they should breathe a sigh of relief because it says... Uh, Swiss researchers performed stress tests on people's two hours and 10 hours after the subjects had sex and found that by 10 hours, the participant, persi participants were fully recovered. So if you have 10 hours, you're fine is what oh, it's okay. Yes. Don't do it so two hours. Day of, you might want to yeah. avoid. Day, no. Yeah. Don't do it the morning. Patrick no. Mahomes, don't do it the morning of our game. Okay. Yes. Yes. No Sunday morning. No, <laughs> no Sunday morning sex for anybody. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of start with that. And then, like I said, we're going to do two little parts here, single sex and partnered up married sex too, um, and a little bit more. So thinking back to when you guys were, you guys are both married. If you guys haven't listened to this before, um, both of the girls are married. Um, Jill's been married for, I'm going to get it wrong. How long? 12, it'll be 12 in, in February. So okay. 11 and a half. Okay. And then Trisha has been married for like four months. Um, or do you laughing? <laughs> no, I mean, that's true. Four months. Yes. Okay. She's been married for like four months. Four months of wedded bliss. Yes. 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 Brent, did you hear that? Yes. Um, exactly. I am not married and I'm 45. So we have kind of a range of people's experiences here. Thinking back to when you guys were single, did you have a timeline for how long you would wait to have sex or yes, or, or and, or do you think people should? You want to go first, Jelly? <laughs> I always had a timeline. Like yeah. I always, I was just raised that way. I was taught that, that you should wait. Did you ever yeah. actually keep it? Yes. Mm -hmm. People should have a timeline. I think you should just. I don't know, because I have friends that had sexual intercourse on the first night and they've been married 20 years. So to say right. that that mm -hmm. rule, like if you were to um, give it up to <laughs> each other, I don't know if I'm using the right words, um, that he wouldn't like you. I yeah. would say it just, it depends on the guy. It depends on the person. Yeah, totally. I don't think there's a rule that could be a blanket statement across yeah. all of it. But yes, I also had um, a timeline, um, you know, from the beginning and I didn't keep, my timeline was a little longer the first time than it was after yeah. that. Like as far as my serious relationships um, went, but I always tried to have a boundary around that. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's important to communicate is just that everything changes the minute you have sex, like mm -hmm. expectations, Absolutely. emotional, mm -hmm. all of that, like. Mm -hmm. 
I'm a big, big advocate for people waiting to have sex till they're older. Cause I just think you're, when you're young and in high school and I was so happy to see that article that kids are waiting longer to have sex. Like mm -hmm. I think again, not that it, again, that you can never make it a blanket statement. Cause we're always going to find a situation that proves it wrong, but mm -hmm. I just think there's a lot of emotions that come with it and not everybody's fully equipped and ready to deal yes. with that. It like catapults you into a whole nother emotional. Level. Yeah. Yeah. Jill, do you ever, I mean, that maybe that's not even a question you ask people in your practice, but are you ever like notice a pattern about people waiting to have sex or not waiting to have sex or anything in your, in your practice? Yeah. No, I, I would say it's across the board. I mean, there are, I actually just had a couple this week that they had sex, you know, the first night that they met and they're married and they have a kid and right. Like, so I think it just kind of depends. And usually when that's the case, I feel like it's one of those, I'm just casual, not looking for anything serious. Um, and then it turns into something else um, versus, you know, I'm really trying, I mean, I think some people who are looking for something more serious tend to have a longer wait time. Like I want to see if this is going to be something that lasts. I want to see if I'm actually interested in this person before I do that. Um, but sometimes those like, I'm just trying to be laid back and casual turn into, Oh, I kind of actually like this guy. So yeah. I think it just, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's one of those things that like, if you're like, well, if the guy is just after you for sex and then you're, he's like chasing you and chasing you and then you finally have sex with them and then he's done with you. <laughs> that's yeah. a horrible thing. And that happens. And yeah. it's whether it's, he's one of those guys that's just after the chase or whatnot. I think the, what the waiting period, what the waiting period does is it like weeds out some of that. And I'm just kind of doing the guy girl scenario. Cause that's what I know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it weeds out some of those people that might just be after that because they're not going to wait a month or whatever your, yep. you know, your timeline is that you put up, right? They're mm -hmm. not going to wait for that. Whereas if you do have sex with the, the guy on a first night and he's still really interested in you, it's not going to turn him off because he was there for all the right reasons anyway, you know? Right. right. It's yeah. not a deterrent. And if it is the, the guy that's like, oh yeah, chase you, chase you, chase you. Okay, finally get your pants and then we're done then that's a filter in my opinion. Like, all right, unfortunate that it happens like that, but I'd rather know sooner rather than later. So yeah. if that's not your, what you're into and I am, then I'm glad I know now, even right. though I know it's hurtful, it's still a sign of, I wouldn't want to attach myself to you anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Steve so Harvey said in one of his books. Um, <laughs> did you add, you quote Steve Harvey a lot and I'm wondering, did you actually read his book? Yeah, I'm, I'm oh, trying to okay. remember the name of it. Um, okay. But anyways, it's like uh, you get hired on a, at a new company and they're not going to give you health insurance for 30, 60 or 90 days. So why would you go sleep with a man and mm -hmm. give him, you know, mm -hmm. and not make him have that waiting? For okay. Yeah. yeah. The insurance company has boundaries and sh so should you is what Steve yes. Harvey is saying. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was trying to like get through that. Um, but that was a great point, Trish and Steve Harvey. Um, I would just like to say, Trish, have you not read my book, but you've read Steve Harvey's books? Because oh, I am read are going to be heard. Oh my God, Steve Harvey's book is like. But I didn't realize you'd been best friends with Steve Harvey since sixth grade. Oh my God. I struck a nerve. You did. You struck a nerve. I'm oh, just kidding. I love it. Now I want to Google what his book was. So. I know. I want to know what the name of the book is. I'm going to link it in the blog so everyone can read it. Right. <laughs> Don't buy my book. Buy Steve Harvey's book. Yeah. Um, so, okay, great. And so we kind of just talked about this. There's a, there, there kind of is a myth that sex can impact the relationship too soon. Cause really it's about what the person's after. Um, so again, thinking back to, when you were single, were you ever able to be one of those people that could like separate sex from emotion or like separate compartmentalize it? I will go first. I absolutely could not. And I would always kind of lie to myself, like, especially if I like liked a guy and I like wanted it. Mom and dad, you can turn it off now or you can at least fast forward for two to three minutes. Thank you. Um, 
No, but like if I wanted to can you continue seeing a guy like I do, he wanted to keep it casual. I do that thing where I lied to myself and lied to my friends and said, Oh, I really don't want anything either. Like, I'm really good with just this. I'm just like after being by myself right now, too. When I knew like the minute that physical, whatever that chemical thing is in our brain, and I don't know if it happens more for women than for men, it would click on and I was going to be attached and I was going to get hurt if they pulled away. Mm -hmm. So I was not someone that was able to compartmentalize. Like the emotions came whether I wanted them to or not. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? You not want to say probably for various reasons. No, I would be. I'm a open book. I just, yeah. um, I, my experience was that I never had sex with anyone that I didn't eventually have a very long relationship with. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also feel like that was purposeful. So therefore, I did not do that until I knew this was going to be something that lasted at least mm -hmm. what I thought I knew. Cause you don't know, obviously until you really start dating. Um, but I had to wait until I felt comfortable in that way before I would give that part of myself to someone. So I would definitely say emotion is very much tied to sex for me. Yeah. Yep. Do you, do you want to answer? <laughs> you don't have, did you say I concur? Yes, she did. <laughs> um, so, Jill, do you have like a scientific, <clears throat> not to put you on the spot, reason no, why women, why we're like this? Like why? And I know, and I, hey, I know not all women are because we have friends that will be like, oh, you guys are crazy. Like, <laughs> it's just fun. Why do you guys act like that? Like, I know there are women, not all women are tied emotionally. Can They can compartmentalize. They can have sex like a man. Like, yeah. not all women are like that. So I really don't want to pigeon everyone, pigeonhole everyone into my feelings. But um, why the majority of women um, tend to feel emotional connection after sex. I mean, I just looking at it from like a scientific perspective, I would, I don't have a stat for like, but I do thinking about like, it's literally I mean, not to get too graphic, but like they're entering you. Like it's like you were like, you were like a puzzle piece that connects. Right. And so that's super intimate to allow someone into yourself. And I think that that just from a scientific biological, even perspective, plus I don't know, I'm just guessing, but I feel like I read this somewhere. There is a chance that we could get pregnant every time that we have sex. Like, obviously, right. let's try. So that is a huge risk for women to take. This is subconscious, of course. Right. Yeah, right. And so this, you know, 15 minute, 30 minute experience could actually be a 10 month nine month, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes there's an attachment there of, or like a, you know, there's like, more risk for us. Well, maybe. It is. And so therefore it's more emotional. And so mm -hmm. if I wanted to take that risk on you, that means I care enough to do so. And mm -hmm. that, therefore you get attached. I don't know. Yeah. I'm always wondered like where chemistry comes from. Like, you know, like there's like a biological element to it. Yeah. And there's 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 yeah, and then there's just a practical element to it, like attract, like physical attractiveness and having a great conversation. But then there's also this like biological level that our bodies want to mate with someone that will produce good, good, strong, healthy offspring and build better genetics. So you know what I mean. So let's shift gears a little bit to marriage or long-term partners because um, you guys can fill me in on all all, all the good details about that. Um, so. Both of you, and then Jill, you with your expertise, what do you tell, what is the hardest part about like keeping chemistry and the spark of sex alive in a marriage? I mean, I think it's the shift from each other. I mean, what I see most within my practice is the shift from each other to the family. And so when that happens, it can become their norm long-term, not just within the infant stages, right? And then they end up just not being connected anymore and not having sex. And I mean, even though more often than not, the men would like to continue and the women are like, but we haven't even talked all day or we haven't had, you know, 
I haven't talked to you in days because we're dividing and conquering. So it be, can become that. And then they're tired, right? Because at the end of the night. So it's just like as life evolves and it gets harder and life is like has more stressors and there's more things on the to-do list. It's not as easy to compartmentalize when you're only taking care of yourselves, you know, which is at the beginning of most relationships. That's what happens. So there's not as much free time. There's not as much space in your brain because of all the stress. And from what I hear from my friends and whatnot, it's like, like you were saying, Jill, the guys will kind of be like, all right, let's do this. And they don't really need any, they don't need to like reestablish the connection or like have the emotional anything. They're just like, all right, let's do this. And women are like, wait, we need to smooth over whatever fight we just had, or we need to build back up that connection before I can get there. And guys are just like, no, like, let's just have sex before we go to bed, you know? Or I felt like you haven't been helping and therefore you're not, I don't feel like you're a partner with me in this. And so that's an attractive. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think it goes back to kind of what I shared in in a previous podcast that men don't need that to feel love. Like typically 99.9% of men have physical touch as one of their love languages. They just do like every man that's sat on my couch, except for maybe five um, has had a physical touch love language. And so that means they don't need the other things, acts of service and quality time quite as much to feel love. Therefore, if they don't have sex, they don't feel loved. Like the sex is where they get the love. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So yeah. the, the yeah. women, more of them, more often than not, they are not physical touch love languages. And so they aren't, if they're not getting acts of service, they don't feel loved. They're not going to want, I always say women need this before they can do this, which means partnership. Like I, in conversation, in action, um, which you know, a lot of times quality time and acts of service are two of the top ones for women. So if they don't have that, then they're not going to want to like let that happen. Let you in. Yeah, let you in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Open the gates, if you will. Um, right. And so I think to me, that's kind of, I think what happens, it's not that men are like, oh, whatever, I don't need emotion to have sex. They get their emotion from sex. They, mm-hmm. they Their cup is filled from sex. And so it is that. It when is in your... In your practice, what do most people complain about when it comes to sex and intimacy? Like, what what are they saying to you? Frequency. Frequency, Frequency. 100%. Yeah. It's not even that it has to be like, you know, fireworks and every single time. It's just that I want to know that you care enough to want to connect with me in that way on a regular basis. And that's just not how most women are wired. It's just not. They so I know every they're like I am taking care of you and I am so men want the frequency. What do the women want? Like they just want the men to be more obviously acts of service, yes, doing yes, like all the time and like how yep. was your day? And I'm actually listening yep. and making eye contact yep. and thoughtful responses. And yep. like that is normally mm-hmm. the two things that they would need. And I always say, unloading the dishwasher is foreplay. Like right. it mm-hmm. really is. If you were married to an acts of service person, you should be doing those sort of things. Um, well, I mean, no matter what, as a partner, I think you need to be helping each other. But if specifically you are with an acts of service person, and I would say that is women's number one is acts of service. Like men's is physical touch typically, and women's is typically acts of service. So you have to know that so that you are filling their cups so that you each get what you want. I would say if you're filling theirs, and then they will want to automatically fill yours because yep. they feel the love and it comes more naturally. So I, everyone's different, but what do you think is a normal amount of sex for people, normal amount of frequency, normal amount of times that people married are having sex per week? Is this now in our forties or are we talking if you're ever in your thirties? Like, cause it well, why, don't, why don't we do a few times? Why don't we do thirties and then forties? Cause I feel like people always do that. Like girls get together and they go, how many times a week are you guys having sex? Like, are we normal? Like they try to find the right baseline and like gauge if they're normal or not. Yeah. yeah. I just think that's, they're setting themselves up for a family. Well, you don't have to answer personally for you guys. But no, like, I, I will friends. totally say what I think is, you know, but I'm just saying when people are like doing the comparison, yeah, thing, because yeah. Not everybody's built the same. No, and no they're definitely not. Can be just as happy having sex once a month versus yep. somebody who's happy having sex once a week. Yep. Or you know what I mean? So I just, in your practice, how many times do you think people are having sex? Like in the um, average of your couples? If I had to quantify, I would say 
so sad. Once a week. Once a week. Um, I thought it was going to be worse. No. Um, I do have some couples that – are we talking what they actually have or what they wish they had? Because that's also oh, – Okay. What, what do they have? Okay. So I would say on average, it's usually once a week, if not every, every two weeks. Okay. That's like what they're actually having. Okay. Um, what they want to have – I would say the men would prefer at least once a week. This is all majority. This is not all. I always want to say that because, sure, um, sure. but they would prefer more than once a week. And I would say on average, the women would say, I don't care if I have, well, some will say, I don't care if I ever have it again. Um, some will say, some will say once a month is good for me. Right. So, you know, I, we talk about. Do you ever have, have oh, go ahead. No, sorry, you go. Do you ever, is it always the women that are saying this? Is there ever a guy, no. the guy that's no. never the guy that's no, like, no, I don't it care? Not, it is sometimes the guy. Like, that's oh, what I was going to say. Like, in the thir- in my in 30s, I would say what I just said. But then as the men start to age and they get into their 40s, I often have guys that will say, like, I'm not that into it anymore. Like, I don't need to have that anymore. And I'm sure it's because their testosterone is going down, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're not, that's not their thing. And you can tell there's like shame in admitting that. Like yes, you can tell that sure. they're like, this is not how I'm supposed to be, but I actually don't really care about it anymore. And what's funny is those are the ones that are normally married to the physical touch women, which are not super common either. So, but at the same time, I also have couples that are like, yeah, we're both kind of on the same page. Like I'm yeah. aging and he's aging and we you know, get our rocks off, sitting on the back deck, having wine and having conversation right. and then snuggling in bed after. Like it doesn't right. have to be a full on, you know. Right. We high five at the end of the day and it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the key is to talk about it. Like what are your expectations? Mm-hmm. What are your wants and needs? Where are we at? Because those change. I always say like, don't just take it and say, okay, this is how it's always going to be. Right. It can change. It can change based on my stage. It can change based on your stress level and things that happens in your life. Um, so it can change on like what's going on with, you know, kids and their ages and staying up at night. So you should always be in communication about it. If they don't know how you're feeling, then how can they change or help it? You know? Right. Communication is key. (laughs) Yeah. Because Jill's my friend. Yes. Yes. You've got to be transparent, period. It's not fair to not be like, you have to be like, you know, you can't be over there all resentful if you haven't shared with them that we're only having sex you know, once a month and I'm like dying over here. Well, you got to talk about it. Right. But I'll tell you what is a huge turnoff for women. Like I literally was like, I've got everyone to say this. Please. I have so many people that will say two things. It is a turnoff when they grope me, when they're all over me, when they make every single touch sexual. Mm -hmm. And I always tell the guys like that. I know our physical touch love language. I promise you, if you touch them in a non-sexual way, you will get more sex. If you are connecting with them in a non-sexual way, that will make them happy. You know? yeah. yeah. When you think about like couples going into a marriage, like where does sex land in the like one, two, three priority? Mm. For the male or the female? Well, I mean, I think for you as a marriage counselor, like oh, I know the like, importance of it in a relationship. Yes. Oh, I thought you were saying like, they come in and why are they coming in? Um, well, I mean, I think it's very important because it is, it is so, it's such a high priority for men. And so if you're going to have our sexual relationship and um, it's going to be a high, you know, priority for them because the majority of them are physical special love languages. And so, you know, you're going to have to make it important. It might not be super important to the female, but it, if I had to like guess would be super important for the guy. And so you have to make that a priority if it's important to your partner. Yeah. I think we can do really good things for a relationship. I think, you know, there's times where you're like, man, why don't we do this more? I mean, most of my couples will be like, we don't really do it very much. And every single time we do, I'm like, why don't we do this more? Because Mm -hmm. it releases chemicals that make you feel lighter and less stressed and more in love. And it's like going to the gym. Yeah. And it usually you're in a better mood at when you do and therefore you get along better. And it, you know, I, I think it's super important. Yeah. And coming 
pretty fresh out of a premarital class. Like, I wish I could remember their cute little acronym, and I know Brent would know it if he was yeah, sitting yeah. here. But it's definitely one of the top four things. Like, when they, their little thing of, like, finances, yep. whatever, and intimacy, physical touch being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. You know. But again, too, that's where, like, when you go through that part of the premarital course, it's like, well, where do you rate this? Where does your partner mm -hmm. and how far off are we? Yep. Right? Like, there's always a spectrum with everything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if he's rating it as number one and I'm rating it as number 10, then that's a huge problem. But, you know, where do you fall on like, that's how they broke it down for like each of like the top four yeah. things that are back important. To, like, your expectations, yep. your needs, yep. and doing it in a rating system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the younger generation, I guess, like Gen Z is having less sex, which is mm -hmm. interesting. Um, yes, I did read that article. You said yeah. And they said it's kind of like for an array of decisions, um, like a connection to technology rather than people. Maybe people oh. are also prioritizing like their academic lives more focused on themselves and just kind of like less focused on relationships and hooking up. Like there's just saying like, I'm going to focus on getting into law school and I have no time for, you know, even getting on the apps and just finding a person, you know, finding anybody to have sex with. Like they're just, people are kind of like more focused on themselves. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I'm not really sure. I'm not even really sure like what the downside of that, of that would be. It's just kind of an interesting fact. Yeah. Yeah. Like is the, you know, in that article, it talked about like the birth rate decline, but is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, we have a lot right. of people in this world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and they were saying more or less like, you know, talking about as generations get older and are there even going to be the people staff to take care of them in the nursing mm -hmm. homes and mm -hmm. that's the downfall of the birth rate decline, but, but right? Like, like yes, yes, like that's the downfall of it. But mm -hmm. no, I mean, I definitely got the takeaway, you know, just about kids focusing more on their careers, doing stuff, but also I think technology has played a huge part. Like I thought it was oh. interesting how they talked about some people have best friends that they've never even met face to face, like right. all through a social FaceTime or whatever, but have never like sat next to. Yeah. And to me, mm -hmm. that was just bizarro but yeah. but it's like a whole other ball game yeah we didn't grow up yeah like that and then i think yeah. these poor kids that went through covid and were really isolated are just gonna have a tough time figuring out like as maybe they finish high school kind of mm -hmm. talking more of like that middle school generation i think i don't yeah. know yeah i mean i feel my niece has been in college for i don't know how long has she been in college a month now yeah. and just talking to her um I'm like, wow, she's really doing college different than we did. <laughs> yes. She's just like so much more. It's not even, she is yes. serious, but so much more together. You know, she like goes to the gym every day. Obviously she goes to class. She's one up on me right there. Just going to class. She has right. a job. Especially freshman year. Yeah. Well, yeah. She has yeah. a job. She, um, you know, she went to like a party last night and I was like, you know, if I had gone to like a frat party last night, I would be like out of, you know, completely hung over today, blah, blah, blah. She like went for a few hours and came home and then had to work today. You know, like that, just like, she's like, we're yeah. so responsible, but she's focused on what she's doing and why she's there. And if that's just, you know, not how I operated until like the, my last semester, I don't think. Yeah. You know? yeah. so maybe that's the pro of it is yes. that, mm -hmm. and, and the first one is the con. So like the, you know, at the whole electronics thing and not being comfortable with physical intimacy, like whether they're sitting next to someone and having a conversation yeah. or hugging, kissing on the lips when you say hello, whatever right. it is, you have to be comfortable with physical intimacy is much different. It's much different than this. Um, but the flip side of that, which you were saying, like the focus on themselves, I think the longer you can wait, especially when your brain's not developed until it's 25 years old fully, then the better when you're making a decision like sex, um, because of the attachment and because of the boundaries that you'd like to have and all of that. And so that's the pro I think to this generation is focus on you because this is the time to do it. Yeah. Like, and, mm -hmm. and you go, you know, like doing that and making sure that you're 
doing and having goals for yourself versus, well, I just want to find a person or. Yeah. Yeah. Community doesn't seem so wrapped up in coupling up. Yeah, it's totally not wrapped up in coupling yeah. up at all, yeah. which I think is fantastic. Yes. Um, which also brings me to one of our other, our our last questions too is um, I feel like when we were growing up, like, well, the virginity message I got was don't have sex till you were married. I don't know if you guys got that message, so you can tell me in a second, but definitely got the virginity message of you know hold it forever, <laughs> hold it forever, and I did lose my virginity really late. So I don't even know if that was bad or good. I think it's good because it's not like, you know, having sex younger would have been better. I was not grown up. It, it's nothing. It, I th that's nothing but good things waiting. Um, obviously I didn't wait till marriage because I'm not married yet. Um, I'd be like Steve Sorrell <laughs> right now. Um, but that's not the point. I got the mirror. I got the message of like abstinence, abstinence, abstinence. And yeah. now so much has changed. What's the message you're going to give your kids about virginity and sex? A depends on the child. B no. I mean, I'll definitely encourage them to wait as long as possible. But I think also if you have a 16 or a 17 year old who's been in a relationship or mm -hmm. a different type of, you know, having this friend and it's been a few years, like that conversation is going to look different. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to be so situational. Yep. I mean, obviously when, you know, they're in middle school or whatever, we're going to easily be preaching like, no, we're waiting. Yeah. 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 Right. But right. I'm also, if they're this little mature, yeah, you know, totally depends. Yeah. junior, senior and, they've been hanging out with the same friend for two years. I'm not going to be naive to curiosity. What's happening. Like, yeah. Like, exactly. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Cause I think if we could sit here and say, this is going to be our role and then we're going to laugh at ourselves when we look back on it because yeah. you just never know. No, you don't. And I think, you know, there's something to be said for being super open with your kids about, about this stuff. Like, I mean, my, my kids are in fifth and sixth grade and they probably know more than most fifth and sixth graders as, as far as from their parents. I think we find out in other ways sometimes, but I try to empower them with knowledge so that they feel confident in their bodies and themselves. And so they can make a good decision. Um, and I hope that it's later in their life when they do, but definitely if there was, you know, or if either one of them had a relationship and I feel like their emotional IQ was at a spot where I could tell them this is all the risks and, yeah. You, have, you know, you get to make a decision on that. Um, but these are things I would consider. Uh, I, it'd be hard for me to just be like, yeah, let's go, you know, yeah, because no. I know yeah. all that can come from it. But at the same time, when you think you're in love or when you are in love, I mean, I think there is young love, right? It's harder to explain all of that to them and then not want to, whoops, you know, one night it went a little too far and I want my kids to be protected too. So it's, yeah. It's it's a hard thing to kind of navigate, for sure. Yeah. When you were saying, like, I was referring more to like the whole thing about consent and everything. Like, mm -hmm. I would be nervous for my son if I had. I mean, yeah. I have a, a nephew that I love yeah. a lot, like a son, yeah. and um, that whole thing is so complicated and obviously needs to happen. It's not that I'm saying it didn't. No, that whole yeah. consent conversation didn't need to happen, but. I would be scared as a young man, like, you know, like I would be so scared to make the wrong move and yes. offend someone or have yes. backlash on something I did when I was trying to hit on a girl or yes. Yes. all of these things. And I would worry about, I mean, I would worry about the young men that I care about in my life navigating that, you yes. know? No, I totally agree with you. You know, totally and I think, you know, back to just knowledge, like you have to understand that people might not see that intention as what you are, you know, intending and right. you need to be aware of that. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, it is a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of layers and a lot of sensitivities around the whole thing. Um, and I, I mean, I already told Brock now, like, you know, yes means yes and no means no. And if someone mm -hmm. asks you to stop touching them you stop touching them, you right. know, same with Micah, like it is their body. And if someone has asked you to not do something, you listen. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm already trying to plant those seeds, you know, um, but also just like, how are they going to like know if they're interested in someone or like if someone's like, what if they're nervous to be like, hey, so and yeah. like, oh gosh, I don't want to offend them. Uh, like I can see where it's like a, it could be, be scary. Yeah. yeah. Can you have a one night stand and it actually be fulfilling and not something that you regret? Well, I can't because I'm too big of an overthinker and the next day I totally like beat myself up and feel bad about it. And I wish I wasn't like that because I know Mm -hmm. other people in like the younger generation, they're like all into it. And I'm not saying they're all into one night stands, but they are all into like not beating themselves up and like loving themselves and like all the self Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like it like, let's just lean into it. And like Mm -hmm. that, that was a good time and that was pleasure and I deserve it. And I do not have my Gen X body does not have that part of me. And I would just wake up the next day with like in a shame spiral and, um, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And it's, it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. I know. I I wish it wasn't something that maybe I'll work on that. I think it's the same way for guys. Like, do you think that, I don't think guys probably felt as much shame you know, think, or after a one night stand or do they? I think some do. I mean, I think okay. some do, but, um, definitely not as much as women. Um, maybe not for as long, like not that they can't have that feeling, but I wonder how long it lasts. Like, I think guys can definitely like turn it off. Right. They yeah. can definitely compartmentalize. And again, this is just majority, not all. Um, yeah. They can definitely do the physical thing and compartmentalize, but then, but some of them, some of them get emotionally attached. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, some of them can't turn it off, I think. Yeah. And some of them feel bad about themselves too. You know, some of them like hold themselves to a standard of not having casual hookups and, you know, end up in, end up in a shame spiral laying on their bathroom floor. Yeah. Overthinking in their own. And I think they should have boundaries about it. Just yeah. Like, you know, yeah. anybody. It's like a human. Like, it's nice to have that. I just hate that there's a shame spiral. No, I hate it too. For either I mean, sex. Like, I just, you know, I, I wish it was a little less complicated in that yeah. way. So intense. Yeah. I think it's less complicated. Like I said, the younger generation, it is less complicated for than us old folks. I think we still have like that stay like absent yeah. until Mary yeah. part in our brain. Mm-hmm. And even though we were like slowly chipping away at it, we got older, we like are still, it's still like wired in there. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. So um, that's our sex talk. I think next time we're going to do a breakup talk on how to get through a breakup and what it means to have a broken heart. Cause um, I think that's a fun conversation and I might be an expert at it. I'm not sure. Yeah. You might be the expert. We'll interview yeah, yeah, yeah. you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for overthinking with me this week. Until next time, wishing you all good thoughts. I hope she's cutting a lot of that out. (laughs) I am leaving all the stuff in that you said about Vegas.